bills help homeowners find out whether wind turbines are appropriate for their area and cuts the red tape to have them installed. Using wind energy for electricity will decrease emissions and cut pollution. We've already passed legislation to remove, reduce our city emissions 80% by 2050, and we need to utilize all renewable sources like wind, solar. Uh, as new technologies are making wind turbines practical to use in cities, we must work to encourage their use and decrease impediments that New Yorkers may encounter when trying to install them. Currently, it can be burdensome to install wind turbines on buildings because it requires, uh, you know, there are very few regula regulations, a lot of red tape, and we lack the geographic information. 48A, as the speaker said, requires a wind energy resource assessments to identify areas where wind uh, can be utilized in the city of New York so homeowners can take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, 50A allows for the cutting of red tape and bureaucratic hurdles for installing small wind turbines. This puts forth regulations relating to how they should be removed and installed, how fast they can go, what, you know, how it should be locked during a hurricane, all of the important information that homeowners would need um, to make it easier for them to make choices. It's very easy to be traditional. We have to make it just as easy to be green in the city of New York, and then folks will make those decisions based on their green choices. So again, I want to thank my colleagues uh, for their support, and again, our great speaker, Corey Johnson, for his great leadership on the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next up, we have Introduction 96A, sponsored by Councilmember Peter Koo. Uh, which would allow residential cooperatives to file a single consolidated energy efficiency report where the cooperative covers multiple buildings on a different tax block. So I want to invite Councilmember Koo to come up and discuss his bill. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Johnson and my colleagues for supporting Intro 96A, a bill that will allow residential cooperatives to consolidate their energy efficiency reports. In, to, uh, in 2009, the city passed Local Law 87, which requires certain large buildings to audit their energy uh, consumption and to submit energy efficiency reports. These energy efficiency reports document any actions taken by taken for the buildings to come into compliance with the law. As we know, many residential cooperatives have multiple buildings on different tax locks, and Local Law 87 requires each of them to submit separate reports uh, with separate deadlines. This health hazard uh, filing system creates an administrative nightmare where management companies are constantly scrambling to meet deadlines for multiple buildings. Allowing residential co-ops to consolidate their energy efficiency reports will significantly reduce this administrative burden for th those well-intentioned properties looking to comply, uh, comply with Local Law 87. As residential co-ops are the leading middle-class options for home ownership in many parts of the city, especially in Law Fee Queens, this effort will streamline reporting and simplify paperwork for both the city and property owners. Ultimately, this will cut the red tape by making it easier for more buildings to come into compliance with the city's sustainability laws, which are so important in our modern and environmentally conscious cities. I'd like to thank Speaker Chair Constantinidis and his staff. I also like to thank Jeff Baker, Ed Akin, uh, uh, Samir Wow Swanson, Laudia Johnson, uh, John Souser, Brenda McKinley, and Megan Chen. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Koo. And uh, lastly, we have Resolution 176, sponsored by Councilmember Donovan Richards, which expresses support for Governor Andrew Cuomo's commitment to and facilitation of the development of large scale offshore wind projects by 2030. Councilmember Richards could not join us today, but we thank him. Uh, that concludes the agenda for today's stated meeting, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes, and I'm sure you all have a lot of questions on these very important bills uh, that we're passing today. Josh. Can I ask questions at a Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, do you have a position on the residential parking permit program? 
Well, we're going to review the legislation. I know that uh, chair of our transportation committee, Adonis Rodriguez, has introduced a bill on this, which I believe is a citywide bill. And council members Rosenthal and Levine introduced a separate bill affecting Manhattan above 60th Street. Um, you know, there are some pluses and minuses. Uh, I understand that there are many folks that live in communities across the city who find it very frustrating that they can't find parking in their neighborhoods. Uh, we also are trying to disincentivize cars in New York City. We're trying to get people to use cars less in New York City. And so I am not fully versed on all the specifics of the bills, but I know they're being introduced. They'll go through the legislative process, and I look forward to reviewing them with the members who introduced them and the members of the council. Do you have a position or have your lawyers given any position about whether it requires state approval? It's my understanding that we are allowed to do it, that state law says that municipalities with a population of over one million people are allowed to enact residential parking. And so I believe we do have the authority to do this. Is that correct to the lawyers? Hmm. Yes? You think so? Hmm. You're, you're what? We're, we're confident? We're confident about it. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I thought you said we're confined. <laughs> yes, Will. I mean, I, I don't stand here to make promises. The things will go through a legislative review. And clearly you can tell from the chair of the Four Hour Vehicle Committee uh, that he has very strong opinions on this and has had a series of hearings looking at the TLC, looking at the Four Hour Vehicle industry. There's a package of bills related to uh, Four Hour Vehicles like Uber and Via and Lyft, as well as looking at green and yellow taxis uh, and how the TLC operates. And so I am open to those bills. <clears throat> I haven't personally come to any conclusion. I do think that there is a significant amount of congestion that is created by four hire vehicles. There was a study that was done, which I think was a very interesting study and the media wrote about. I don't know, Will, if you wrote about it, but I know that it was written about by a gentleman named Bruce Shaler, who looked at the four hire vehicle congestion concerns uh, basically in Manhattan and talked about the amount of time that these four hire vehicles uh, don't have passengers in them and that are circling blocks and the amount of congestion that occurs because of that. He came up with some recommendations that he wanted included in the hopefully a congestion pricing bill that would pass Albany. The bill that passed Albany, which I think relates to four hire vehicles because of the surcharge that was included on Uber and on yellows and greens, I don't think is really a congestion bill. I think it's really, a, which is fine, it's sort of a two-step process. It's a revenue generation bill. So it's gonna bring in hopefully more than $400 million a year, uh, which we can then invest in the MTA. But the package of bills that's being introduced today, I think looks to further regulate uh, the for hire vehicle industry. As we know, as you all know, who are here covering the council and the administration in 2015, uh, there was a cap bill that was put forward. It was not brought for a vote, Councilmember Levin's bill. And um, in hindsight, we've seen such an explosion of for hire vehicle license says it may have been wise to adopt that bill. And so to, for us to look at further legislation and uh, on this area, I think is important. We're gonna see that hearing happen. I look forward to hearing what my colleagues think. We haven't had a full robust discussion as a body about where the membership is. I think we need to look at further regulation. I support looking at further regulation, but I, this is me, you know, I haven't looked at every single bill. Um, there's so many bills that are introduced, but I support us looking for further regulation on this area. Further regulation to what extent? I think we have to be open-minded. I think we have to look at, um, right now, the taxi industry is so well regulated on the number of licenses and medallions on how they're allowed to operate, on the data that we receive, on how they travel across the city. Um, they're not allowed to do surge pricing uh, in yellows and greens. So there's a, basically a different set of rules as it relates to yellows and greens compared to the for hire vehicle industry. 
And I think we have to look at, are there ways to have some level of parity? It may not be totally possible, but to ensure that regulations that we think that have worked on yellows and greens may be smart things we could look at for the for hire vehicle industry. Samar? Yes. So um, my plan is to uh, ensure that any of the four council appointments are not people that have any conflict of interest and that we haven't uh, arrived on any particular names at this point. Um, we're still having conversations about who are some very substantive, well-respected people who have a lot to bring in looking at the structure of city government. We will, of course, vet as we do on every nomination that comes to the city council, we're gonna thoroughly vet every single person from the council side. Um, I would hope that the other folks that have appointments to the commission will do the same exact thing. Um, I hope that they similarly live up to that standard. Uh, but I, I don't have, I think the initial names that people have talked about internally, none of them are people that have ever given me money in my campaigns for office. Um, and I expect that to be the case when we make final appointments. Any expectation of when the appointments start? So the, uh, Rob, Jeff, correct me here, the, the, the mayor I don't believe is signing it into law, so it will become law without his signature. So it will become law on what date? May 11th is when it will become law. And then after May 11th, I would think that before the end of May, you will see appointments that are made uh, by the council and by the other appointing officers of the Charter Revision Commission. Aaron? Um, records from the uh, Department of Homeless Service believe to show that there are hundreds of arrests, uh, drug incidents, uh, spikes, and other incidents that were omitted from the report that originally they claimed that there were none, and, and actually there were, there were many that had occurred. Do you think the city it's, is it's on honest with the public it, about um, you know, the, the state of security and homeless service? It's unacceptable. We need transparency on these figures. You should not have any incongruity between what the PD data is on arrests and incidents in homeless shelters and between what DHS is reporting. So we support, I support, um, I don't speak for the other members up here, but I support uh, full transparency and ensuring that the numbers match and that it's important for us to be transparent because we need to know where to direct resources if we need additional peace officers, if we need uh, folks that are doing drug treatment programs, if we need other measures inside of DHS homeless shelters. I think in the Greg Smith uh, piece today, there were three shelters that were talked about. There was the Bedford shelter in Brooklyn, there was the Kipps Bay Men's Shelter on 30th Street, and there was uh, another shelter as well that had seen the highest number of violent incidents and arrests, and the peace officer DHS numbers were not matching the PD numbers. They should match each other, and we should be honest about where there are problems so that there's accountability, transparency, and we can improve it shelter by shelter. If they need additional resources, they should come to the council, or the agency should reappropriate resources within to take care of these issues. You have? I don't think so. Um, the reason why I don't believe that's the case is I've said to the administration over the last month that if you looked at the IBO estimates on revenue and re-estimates and spending and what they project the city budget to be at, if you looked at what the council finance division looked at, the IBO was high 
OMB was low, and we were somewhere in the middle. So we're not looking this looking at this just as one piece. We think there's a whole pie to look at. I think uh, you're going to see tomorrow that there is a significant amount of new revenue that's projected when the mayor gives his executive uh, budget presentation. And so we have to figure out where that money goes. I think we have to make one very important point here. When the mayor became mayor and started his term in 2014, the city budget was around $71 billion. I think tomorrow we're gonna see a potential adopted budget somewhere between 89 and $90 billion. So almost a $20 billion growth in four years. The mayor in his state of the city said that he thought that we should be the fairest city in America. One of the ways to become the fairest city in America is to implement and fund fair fares. Fair fares equals helping us become fairest city in America. And <clears throat> we can look at how we spend money, we can look at new revenue, <clears throat> and we can look at potential savings. I've been open to looking at a citywide savings program, agency by agency, in the council's preliminary budget response, we very quickly came up with $400 million in savings, pretty easily, in a conservative fashion. So we think there is a way to fund $212 million for fair fares, while at the same time doing the $125 million for fair student funding. We actually called for $250 million in fair student funding by repurposing existing DOE funds that we thought would benefit more students. So we don't think they're competing against each other, and we think there's enough revenue, there's enough to put into a savings program, there's enough on re-estimates that we could do both. Matt? What do you make of the mayor's argument that this essentially sets a bad precedent for funding the MTA? I, I've said this to him. This is not funding the MTA. This is not subset. This is funding poor people. These are very, these are two different things. We are not putting money directly into uh, capital in the MTA on this particular thing. Signals, station enhancements. This is going to human beings who would end up saving over $700 a year. It's heartbreaking, and I took the subway here uh, this morning. It's heartbreaking when you see people, and there was someone there this morning um, who got swiped in by someone else asking for a free swipe. Just trying to get to work. So this is, not, this is not subsidizing and funding the MTA. The city already does this for senior citizens, for students. There's precedent on this. It's the right thing to do if we want to be the fairest city in America. And can you also talk about the letter that you and the mayor sent to the MTA regarding seaside access and accountability? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important that since the city is on the hook for the $418 million as part of the subway action plan, uh, that the state mandated on us through the uh, state budget on April 1st, that we have real say in how that money is spent. We have updates on what's happening with the plan, that we're able to have input in a meaningful way on if the plan should be modified, on how the money's being spent, how quickly it's getting out the door, how quickly the signal repairs are happening. I think we want, that letter was about a level of accountability and transparency since a significant amount of uh, city money is going into it. Do you have any of those answers now? You know, if you look at the subway action plan as it was presented and you look at what chairman Loda said at our preliminary budget hearing he talked about some of the work that has gotten done so far some of the signal repair work some of the track repair work which is happening but he said at the time and this is why we sent the letter to get a more fulsome update he said at the time that he needed the additional funds to hire up more workers to actually expedite the work and get it done more quickly on these critical repairs. We want to understand how much work's been done and what else can be done as soon as the money is infused into the MTA, both on the capital side and on the expense side. The expense side is predominantly hiring more workers. The capital side is signals, track repair work, critical infrastructure work. Anyone else? Brendan. So, as I said before, when I talked about the technical uh, bills that we're passing today on cleanup, the two bills that we're cleaning up, you know, the council two weeks ago passed 
a sweeping legislation to hopefully combat sexual harassment in the workplace um, because we've seen what's been happening around the country with the Me Too movement. And once this legislation takes effect, once the mayor signs these bills into law, much of this information has to be made public. So we feel proud of the fact that our package of 10 bills and one resolution really goes to the heart of the information that was disclosed by the mayor's office, agency by agency. Um, we passed a rule in the council, we're gonna similarly have to disclose these numbers and be transparent. And so we think it's important and maybe our package of bills helped push this information out there. You have? Just on, on the same issue, uh, yep. the DOE, there was the highest number of complaints that the DOE reached out one of the biggest, biggest agencies, yeah. Um, there was 471 complaints under this administration, under the de Blasio administration, and only seven cases substantiated. Uh, it's, uh, it's shocking. And um, the mayor was asked about that today, and he, he seemed to kind of cast it. He, he spoke of a general culture at the I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Samar? Uh, can you clarify the, the laws that the city council passed and the mayor's bring up this information? What applies to what? Because he said he wants to bring all the agencies in line in one rule and one standard. Is, well, much of, much of what they disclosed on Friday, uh, if not all, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, they were going to be required to do once the bills took effect. So there was gonna be reporting agency by agency on the number of complaints, on the number of substantiated complaints. There were gonna be climate surveys, um, which maybe goes to the heart of the DOE question to understand what the climate is like agency by agency. And so I think everything that they disclosed, they were gonna be required to disclose by our package of bills, which will become law soon, is that correct? Yes. So everything they disclosed, they were going to be required to disclose once our bills become law. So I guess the follow-up is, um, how do you feel about the fact that the mayor only did this once he seemed like he was forced to and not before when people were asking about it for months? I think that the number of substantiated complaints in the DOE, the low number is shocking. That only seven out of 400 were substantiated. That just seems... There's a level of incongruity there that's hard to understand. I think there was a major wake up call across the country on how these issues are being swept under the rug and not looked at in a really open way for us to understand the extent of the problem. And so I think many people are at fault on that city government clearly we saw through our package of bills could do a much better job we at the council figured out that we could do a better job which is why we passed a rule requiring it on ourselves so i think there is a to go around hopefully a greater understanding and enlightenment on the ways we were failing in the past before the harvey weinstein madness really changed the conversation and how we look at these things. And everyone's been playing catch up. And now we have to do a much better job. And hopefully with the transparency and accountability, we will have more information to actually understand how pervasive this issue is and what else we can do for victims and survivors. Jacob? Uh, if anyone could figure out how to get inside the head of a uh, former council member, former deputy controller, now state senator and man in the middle, Simka Felder, I am not that person. 
but clearly, the governor I saw today on Twitter wrote a letter to uh, Senator Felder, uh, looking at, telling him that he believes that after the November elections, his vote will not be the deciding vote and that Democrats will take back the state Senate. I think if you saw the elections last night uh, in Westchester with Shelley Mayer's win, she wanted a higher number than George Latimer had ever won by in his previous elections. If you look at the assembly seat out on Long Island, which the Democrat won by over 10 points, which has been controlled by uh, a Republican for over 30 years, I agree with the governor's assessment. I think there's going to be a blue tidal wave across the country. I really believe that. And I think that we are going to take enough state Senate seats that Simca will not be the state Senator Felder, will not be the deciding vote. And so um, clearly he made his intent known yesterday, saying that he's staying with the Senate Republicans. I support a unified, progressive, Democratic majority led by Andrea Stewart-Cousins, and I think that's going to happen, and I'm going to be committed this fall to working on seats to help take away, uh, to help bring more seats to the Democratic majority. Do you think that the Democrats should give up on some legislation in order this year in order to bring... I think Simca made it clear he's not coming over. I think it kind of ends at that. Will? Uh, part of me, even though I don't like the fact that he's caucusing with the Republicans, I respect the fact that he actually ran on the Republican line. You know, he's, he's not like other folks who ran as Democrats and then caucused with the Republicans and were in a coalition with Republicans. So part of me feels like he was more honest than other folks about it and his constituents uh, elected him in some ways on the Republican line um, on, on the particulars of that, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I, I'm focused on the budget right now. Uh, and, um, you know, Simca is an entertaining, larger than life, big personality. Uh, and I hope that after these November elections, we will have such a wide Democratic majority that he will come back and be part of that majority. At this point, I don't see any action on it. Any other questions? Uh, Jeff. Yes. Uh, the uh, building to, the bill to limit uh, energy bill use uh, introduced last session by uh, Mr. Trump and House Energies. Just any update on that? Are we going to see uh, that? Do you want to speak on this? Yeah, yeah I okay. mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, 70 percent of cities' emissions come from city buildings. Uh, these uh, large buildings that are 25,000 square feet or above are responsible for close to 30 percent uh, of the city emissions. It's something we're taking very seriously. I'm working very closely with our speaker. Corey Johnson on it. We are still looking to craft uh, legislation to make it even better and look forward to introducing it uh, very soon. Anyone else? Samar? Speaker, are you going to watch Avengers this weekend? Who's your favorite Avengers? <laughs> uh, you know, this weekend's my birthday, so I'm turning 36 on Saturday, and I think I'm going to this weekend uh, go to Spa Castle. Uh, to, to take a little break and to maybe get a, a Manny and a Petty uh, and, and, and sweat out the preliminary budget response. Thank you very much. College point, though. It's, it's in your district? district. Yeah. No, not my district, but in my neighborhood district. You, who is in Paul Valone's district? Paul district yeah. I'm not inviting Valone. <laughs>